Good morning, good day, and good evening to all our attendees joining us for today's latest Data Science Central webinar. I'd like to start our event off today by thanking Microsoft for sponsoring today's event. We appreciate their support of the Data Science Central community, and we are honored to have them sponsoring our webinar today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Cisco, Tableau, Hortonworks, Oracle, Pivotal, and Teradata, to name just a few. These past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com, and if you've not had the opportunity to view them, I would encourage you to take a look as they do provide some very useful information. Today's webinar is entitled, Learn How to Work with Large Data Sets to Build Predictive Models with Microsoft's Analytics Toolkit. And before we begin, I'd like to just briefly review the format of today's webinar. Today's event will be approximately one hour long. We have two panelists that I'll introduce to all of you in just a few moments. We should have about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A following the presentation, and this event is being taped and will be made available later on this afternoon at datasciencecentral.com. I'd also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. We will be reviewing them and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. My name is Tim Madison. I'm one of the co-founders of Data Science Central, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speakers, Misha Belinko and Girish Nathan of Microsoft. Misha is a principal data scientist at Microsoft's Azure Machine Learning Product Group. He has more than 10 years of work experience at Microsoft, Google, and IBM and holds a PhD in computer science. Girish is a senior data scientist at Microsoft's Azure Machine Learning Product Group as well, and he has five years of experience working at Microsoft, Amazon, and Yahoo, <clears throat> excuse me, and holds a PhD in statistical physics. Welcome to you both, and thanks for being with us this morning. We're looking forward to your presentation. In today's webinar, we will use a case study of New York taxi data to discuss and cover how Azure provides the infrastructure for storing and manipulating large data sets, how Azure ML provides an algorithm learning with counts to train, predictive, to train a predictive model with large data sets, and how to create a model to predict tips of New York taxi rides using Azure Storage, HD Insight, and Azure ML. So before we begin the presentation, we just have a quick survey or poll. I'd like to ask our audience to just mark the appropriate selection there that uh, indicates your current role so we have an idea of who's with us today. So are you a data scientist, data analyst, data engineer, IT manager, developer, or something else? So I'm going to proceed. Just do a quick you know, mark there, and here we go. Thank you all for participating. Uh, get, give us a good idea of who's with us this morning. And then one more quick one is just to get an idea of who uh, that's with us today has heard of Azure Machine Learning, just to get a sense of uh, your understanding of the product. Uh, mark yes or no, and then I'm going to proceed forward, and I'm going to pass it over to Girish. Very good. Most of you know about it, so you'll get some deeper insight today. So Girish, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can begin as soon as you're ready to go. Sounds good. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Tim. Uh, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, let's get right to it. Uh, this is the agenda of our tutorial for today. Uh, we'll show you how to work with large data sets. Uh, as an example, we will be using the NYC taxi data set. I will uh, briefly tell you about HD Insight, which is Microsoft's Hadoop offering on Azure. And then we will uh, make a segue into uh, how to use an IPython notebook uh, to issue hive queries onto an HD Insight cluster. This can be frequently useful to uh, visualize data, also do some exploratory analysis before downsampling the data for Azure Machine Learning. At that stage, we'll be ready to build predictive models. I will give you a very brief introduction to Azure Machine Learning Studio, uh, uh, basically what it does, why it is good, and what its power is. And then I will hand it off to Misha, who will explain this very cool technique of learning with counts, uh, which can be used to build uh, count features and high cardinality categorical variables. We will then wrap up the tutorial uh, with me showing you an experiment on Azure Machine Learning Studio that uses learning with counts to uh, build predictive models on the NYC taxi data set. Uh, so the sample data, which is the NYC taxi data set, what is it? It's a publicly available data set, which has about a year's worth of NYC taxi rides for the year 2013. 
There were about 173 million rides all in all. The data is about 60 gigs uh, unzipped and publicly available at the location on the slide. It consists of two sets of data. There is a trip data, which consists of the driver ID, uh, the pickup times, the locations in terms of pickup and drop off lat lawn. And then there's also the fare data, which consists of the fare amount, the tip amount, the tolls, the surcharge. Uh, on screen now you should see uh, just a couple of examples of this data set. The uh, top panel that, I'm, uh, that I have my mouse on is basically the uh, trip data, and the bottom panel is the corresponding fare data. In the rest of this tutorial, we will do some data wrangling and uh, finally, like I said, wrap up with some tip prediction. Uh, I also just wanted to take this opportunity at this point to tell you folks a little bit about the tools we will uh, demo. Uh, so, we will be talking in some depth about HD Insight, IPython, and Azure Machine Learning Studio. Uh, I will not uh, be showing anything on AZ Copy, but we'll just mention it at this point that AZ Copy is an efficient way of copying large amounts of data between blob storage in Azure and also between blob storage and uh, local disk. It's a parallel copy that is uh, that can be very efficient. Let's now get on to HD Insight. HD Insight is Microsoft's uh, Hadoop offering on Azure. It's basically 100% Apache uh, Hadoop as an Azure service. Uh, it can deploy uh, on Windows and Linux, and I will actually very shortly uh, show you an example of how it looks when it's deployed on a Windows server. Uh, like any Hadoop service, it provides MapReduce capability over big data in Azure blobs. And at this point, let me actually uh, launch a screen share for you folks to show you two things. One, uh, how to commission a cluster, and two, how to log into the head node of the cluster so that you can uh, look at job and cluster uh, progress and also monitor jobs on the fly. So bear with me one second while I do this. Right. So to commission a cluster in Azure Machine Learning is actually very straightforward. You go to your Manage Azure portal, which is something you have when you have an Azure account, and look for the uh, elephant icon, which is the HD Insight. Uh, once you go there, Gary, uh, you can actually... Not yet. I don't know if you've uh, hit the launch yet. We're not seeing your screen. I have, I have, actually. It's showing live here. Uh, it's actually showing the green screen as well. Can you folks see it now? I am not. Okay, I guess others can, so this is just me. So please proceed. I apologize for that. Okay. No worries. Uh, okay. Uh, no worries. So, uh, so uh, commissioning a cluster is basically as simple as uh, going to HD Insight, which is the elephant icon, uh, clicking on New. This immediately takes us to an HD Insight uh, custom create option. Uh, if you clicked on that. The next step would be to enter your cluster name, a subscription name, what type of cluster you desire. So this could be Hadoop, HBase, or Storm, depending on your needs and what you want to do. Uh, operating system could be Windows Server, which is what I show today. And then you can also choose your HD Insight version. I will not take you through the process just because of uh, time constraints, but uh, once the cluster is commissioned, like here where we have a cluster called uh, Data Science Process, um, you can click the configuration tab, uh, and this basically is the place where you can enable a remote desktop connection. This is very useful because this allows us a way to log into the head node and issue commands from the command line. Uh, so how does that look once you have a remote desktop connection? Let's take an example by taking you directly to the head node of this cluster. Right. So here we go. This is actually what you see when you log into the head node of the data science process uh, HDI cluster for the first time. You see on the left a recycle bin, the Hadoop command line, which is basically the command line URL for uh, launching jobs, monitoring job progress. Let me just niceify this font a little bit here very quickly. Right. And it's very convenient from here to go to the Hive distribution, for example, if you want to launch Hive to the bin and then say Hive. That fires up Hive for us. The other two things of use very quickly that I would like to point out, one is the Hadoop yarn status. 
the Hadoop Yarn status is where you want to go to to look at all your applications and the progress on those applications. For example, here, if I clicked on this application, it tells me that I, uh, I, I tried to run something. It basically says it succeeded. I get how much time it took. Uh, I also get uh, the history if I go in, which has more information on the number of maps and reduces, whether any job failed or not. And also, in addition to that, you get your average map time, the average reduce time, the average shuffle time, and the average merge time. So this is a very useful URL to know. The other useful URL is the Hadoop name node URL which gives information about the cluster itself. It says how much DFS was there, how much is used, number of live nodes, et cetera. So both of these, uh, both of these URLs are actually very useful uh, for us uh, to monitor a job and to also, uh, and to also basically uh, make sure that if something goes wrong, we can quickly debug using the logs as to what went wrong. Let me now take you folks off the screen share and bring get back to the slides here real quick. So uh, that's that's basically the head node and how do you monitor jobs there. Uh, some of the things that come with free uh, when you commission a HD inside cluster are PIG and Hive. PIG is a data flow language. Hive is a SQL-like query language, which is a very good alternative to writing code. Uh, I have given an example of a, of a Hive query uh, here where I'm basically selecting a column and counting on it. And uh, folks familiar with SQL will actually see that uh, this is extremely similar to writing SQL. So that's one, actually, that's one big selling point of Hive is that if you know SQL, you can uh, ramp up on Hive uh, fairly quickly. Okay. Uh, what other tools can we use to monitor jobs and run jobs? One of the things that we have found useful here in the Azure Machine Learning Data Science team is the IPython Notebook. Uh, the IPython notebook is essentially a web-based Python REPL environment. It combines authoring, execution, and visualization, and also enables us to run end-to-end uh, -end machine learning experiments. Uh, you can author and execute HD Insight uh, Hive queries, and I will actually show an example of that uh, very shortly. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind here is that since you are connecting to a cluster, you need to have your credentials set and in place so that the IPython notebook functional functions can access the cluster. This is kind of important. Once you have that functionality in place, then it is actually fairly straightforward to issue Hive commands off of the uh, uh, IPython notebook and then see the results in uh, on the screen. So let's uh, see an example of how to do that. So, so let me take you straight to the fun stuff. Uh, one of the things we're interested in, in with the NYC taxi data is, for instance, we might want to look at how the tip amounts are distributed, what the histogram looks like, right? So in this case, what I'm going to run is just a simple query. It's basically uh, using Hive's native functionality of histograms and just, just using an explode function on top of that so that we can look at the uh, histogram pin centers and the histogram uh, Y values more clearly. And I'm going to run it on the fair data sets. So to run in an IPython notebook, all you need to do is hit the run button, and then uh, that basically runs it. Uh, while this runs, let me go ahead and show you folks what the results look like. So the results basically come in a pandas data frame, and they have two columns. You have an X column, which, like I said, represents the uh, pin center of the histogram, and the Y value is the histogram count. Uh, since we are in an IPython notebook and an Python environment, we can actually clean this up for readability. So, for instance, I've changed the column name to histogram underscore info, and then I've gone ahead and basically uh, cleaned up the data, basically removed the special characters that Hive has. So Hive, for instance, outputs this as a tuple, so there are brackets and other, other things that we remove. And once you have that, this data can actually be plotted. Right. So this is basically now just a table that can be plotted within IPython. To do that, you just invoke your matplotlib inline, uh, import math, and then I'm showing you the histogram count on the y-axis versus the pin value, which is the tip value, basically, on the x-axis. And we can see that, for instance, the histogram tip amounts are peaked at zero. Uh, this confirms uh, exploratory data analysis on the NYC data set in the sense that we know from playing with this data, that about 47% of the tips are $0. So uh, exploratory analysis like this 
can be done fairly easily uh, within an IPython notebook. And this is usually good because we get to play with a small subset of the data and uh, get some insights on it, and then we can move the data to Azure Machine Learning to build predictive models. So let me go ahead and kill the screen share real quick, take your folks back. So let's see. Here we go. Uh, so what is Azure Machine Learning Studio? Azure Machine Learning Studio is essentially a fully managed cloud service. It's a browser-based authoring of data flow. This is very useful because all the machine learning modules and data read and data write modules can be drag and dropped and just connected with, uh, connected with arrows. Uh, the other thing that it has for free is versioning, which, is, which we have found extremely useful in the group because if two people are collaborating on an experiment, it's quite easy to keep track of changes and what uh, uh, another person did, and it's also fairly easy to roll back to quote unquote the best version of the best experiment that we could run. Uh, so that's very useful. In addition to this, it's very important to know that it has the best in class machine learning algorithms from MSR, uh, Bing, Xbox, so that you get uh, basically the best stuff that's out there in terms of ML. There's an enormous amount of support for R, Python, and SQL, which covers a vast majority of data scientists, developers, BI engineers. Uh, like I said, versioning allows us to do collaborative data science, and you can quickly deploy models as web services and REST APIs. Uh, unfortunately, we will not have the time today to take a look at that, but uh, it's, uh, it's basically just the click of a button to go from having a scored model to being able to deploy a web service that you can issue an API call to. Uh, finally, uh, you can publish to a gallery, and these experiments can help both improve the quality of experiments in the Azure Machine Learning Gallery and also for a community level collaboration. And with that, I will hand it off to Misha Belenko, who is Principal Researcher at MSR and Azure Machine Learning Data Science, to tell you folks about this technique called learning that comes. Over to you, Misha. Thanks, Girish. Uh, thanks for tuning in. This is Misha. And I'd like to take a brief aside to describe a simple but very powerful technique for scaling up learning to very large transactional data sets, such as the NYC taxi data that Girish described. Um, the technique is called Simply Learning with Counts. Uh, for those of you who are Sesame Street fans will appreciate that our internal name for it is Dracula uh, because it primarily counts. So let's start with a pretty simple example. Uh, let's consider learning on the very large data sets in domains where there's many entities. Uh, and a simple illustration that all of you can relate to is the uh, prediction of clicks for online advertising. Uh, that's obviously an important problem that pays for much of the internet as we know it. Um, and it's really an interesting machine learning task uh, because the estimation is pretty hard for reasons we'll describe. What happens is uh, we consider here a user entering a query, uh, say to a search engine like uh, Bing or Google, and then advertisement that we're considering to show, showing to them. Uh, what happens here is uh, both the user, the advertisement, and the context, such as the query or the web page, are described by a large number of attributes. Uh, in the case of user, uh, for example, it can be the ID or the IP, um, or in the case of the advertiser, it could be, again, an internal system ID or various short snippets of text in the advertisement itself uh, or in the text. Uh, in, even in the case of context, uh, the query can be thought of as just a single short category of which there is obviously a very large number. And to be clear, the problem is not unique to search ads uh, and display ads. The context is different instead of a query, it's a web page. But nonetheless, you have the same general problem structure. And the key issue here for learning perspective is that we have a very large number of entities uh, taking place. There's a lot of users who are coming in. Uh, there's also lots of advertisers who are trying to show their ads. And there's, of course, a lot of context and a lot of queries uh, which possibly users can show, lots of pages uh, which they can look at. So if we start doing the numbers for typical uh, domains here, uh, we quickly run into billions uh, of users, queries, ads. And since the combinations are pretty relevant, uh, looking at which ad uh, is showing for which query, that's a pretty useful attribute. Again, the number of parameters that we may want to estimate becomes extremely large. And to be clear, the problem we're illustrating this with here is a type of information retrieval task, uh, but it's not 
only specific to ads. So in other retrieval tasks, such as search or recommending, we still have these entities, uh, such as a user, an item, a page, a, and a context, which have uh, a large number of these properties. But it's really any transaction classification task, uh, whether it's fraud, where the entities are the transaction, the product, and the user, uh, spam or intrusion section, uh, Internet of Things uh, also have you know devices, locations, and of course the NYC text data set will set uh, has, has properties of the taxi such as medallion, as well as properties of the context uh, such as the location and the fare. So the core problem for the, for this type of domain is how do we represent all these high cardinality attributes as features for the learning algorithm, uh, since learners typically want the features to come as numeric vectors. And we can isolate these four key requirements for a good representation. Uh, the representation must be scalable. Uh, of course, it must uh, be able to represent those billions uh, and higher number of values uh, that the attributes can take on. And it also must be efficient. Uh, because we may be doing lots of predictions in uh, real time, and so we will want that representation to be computable fairly cheaply. It also needs to be flexible, uh, because we may choose to use a learner downstream that may want to have a low-dimensional vector, such as neural nets or tree ensembles. Uh, and for that, it's nice to have the representation be fairly low-dimensional. And finally, in these domains, there's a lot of change. Uh, users come and go, uh, the advertisers come and go, you know, medallions get reissued, uh, new locations, new ro roads change. So we want the representation to easily adapt to whatever changes happen in the domain. The standard approaches for this type of uh, problem and representing it numerically is to either just encode it as binary features where each binary feature corresponds to a unique value, um, a slight modification on that technique is using hashing, uh, which doesn't require storing a dictionary for all the value to index mapping. Uh, and another modification is using projections, uh, so looking at strings, for example, and computing string similarity functions between the query and the add text, which is projecting them to some string similarity space. Uh, and these are fairly well-known methods uh, for dealing with such a problem. And what we want to describe today is something that uh, in the industry, especially the online industry, the fraud industry, has been a, really a standard technique for some number of years, uh, but unfortunately has not received much attention in academic literature, uh, even though practitioners have been using this uh, very widely. And this talk primarily covers formalization and generalization of that technique, uh, as well as a uh, handoff to Aguirre to show you how it can be used in practice. So let's go to the next slide. So what the technique is, without further ado, uh, is the following. Uh, what we will try to do is we will try to represent every uh, unique value that we see in each of the entities as a simple vector of statistics. Uh, in the example that here, we have four statistics. And the statistics that we're accumulating are really two numbers. Uh, since we're, the historical data consists of history of clicks and non-clicks for online advertisement, uh, we will have just two columns, uh, one counting the number of clicks, one counting the number of non-clicks, uh, where each row corresponds to a unique uh, attribute value. In this case, say IP, uh, but we will have analogous tables for other properties, such as the ID of the advertiser, or combinations of them, such as the combination of the query and the advertiser domain. Uh, since the number of these attributes can grow very, very large, obviously we don't want to keep the whole table in the general case, so we can resort to doing some compression on it, such as only storing values explicitly for the head of the distribution and then collapsing the tail of it into what we show here as this rest bucket. Um, or there's hashing-based techniques such as min count, min count sketch uh, that compress uh, the entire table producing approximate values for the counts, but managing, allowing, it, allowing us to manage the space. So what this technique allows us to do is then, instead of uh, these billions and billions of initial attributes, uh, the representation that we will be using is simply looking up the value for each of the attributes in each example, uh, and then using the counts and quick transforms of them, so in this case, the log odds, which corresponds to a simple naive base estimate of the likelihood of click, in this case, based just on the IP or on the combination of the query and the advertiser. But effectively, you can think of these as just the raw data structures that support naive base. 
except that in a base case, uh, we normally would just add these log odds or multiply the probabilities. Well, here we treat them as features for a downstream learner. And what we also can encode is that if we are collapsing uh, the table, compressing the tables using this, uh, this backoff technique, we can have a separate feature which tells us whether for a current example, the value we just looked up uh, comes from the actual count for that value, for the attribute value, or we had to resort to a backoff either because the value is new or because it's infrequent. What this allows us to do is this allows us to have a representation that fulfills those goals that we outlined earlier. So basically the representation is pretty scalable because we can either store the head in memory and then back off in tail or compress it through sketches. Uh, it is pretty efficient because to create the representation for a given example from the original text features, we're just doing lookups and tables. It's also pretty flexible because the resulting representation is pretty low dimensional, so we can easily feed it into really powerful learners uh, such as boosted trees or neural nets. And finally, it's uh, adaptive uh, because the values that are being added, well, they, if they are strong enough, they can go into the head or in the case of uh, sketches, it doesn't even matter. Uh, and then there's also advanced techniques uh, over this one that allow us using, for example, temporal windows for counts, uh, which makes it pretty straightforward to track uh, time drift and trends like that. So here is what the technique looks like in action. Um, so here we're at this green time T now. Um, and to train our model, what we will do is we will hold out a brief uh, period of time right before T now to train the actual uh, model, such as trees or neural nets. And then over all the history before that, we will perform basically counting, which is constructing those tables. And what we're doing is we're simply aggregating those counts for various binning functions. Binning functions can be just the identity of the attributes, such as the IP, uh, or we can transform it in any way. For example, we can take its hash. Uh, that that just makes it uh, much more straightforward. Of course, we lose the original values, but we don't really need them. Uh, we can also do other transformations, for example, for IPs. We may want to have an explicit table based on just the two first two bytes of the IP, which which will be then uh, fully in memory since it'll be much smaller. And of course, we can play with different backup options. Uh, when we're returning those estimates, uh, we don't have to return the exact estimates. Uh, we can smooth them uh, either with basic Laplace type smoothing where we're just adding some number of, uh, of artificial flex and non flex Or we can uh, actually structure the different estimates from the different tables, like in the IP case, we can smooth the full IP values with the first two byte values. So now that we've constructed the tables, uh, what they provide us is their representation for training the learner. So in this holdout set, uh, we will now use the tables to featureize those examples and feed those training examples to a trainer of the actual model that will be doing the prediction. So here we can see that each of the tables contributes those four features corresponding to the lookup from the table. And if we have other features uh, that are in there organically, like say string similarities or any other types of features that are computed uh, at the time um, of prediction, we can also just append them and we're still ending up with a fairly low dimensional vector, which is quite convenient. So counts, transforms, and lookup properties are all examples of uh, various features that can be injected, as well as additional features that are domain specific or engineered for a given problem. So the nice, uh, the nice property of this approach is that now that we've trained the model and we've created the tables, we can just keep on incrementing the tables as time goes by, effectively resulting in an online learning approach. Because now as new values appear, they will enter the tables. Uh, as old values become less important, uh, we can have a process that will clean up the tables, uh, keeping only the tail in there. Well, the model itself, the strong learner that we trained, does not really need to get updated since all it does is effectively picking sort of what are the right combinations of the experts or the tables. So for example, if the, the example of a, of a tree that may be learned is something which would say that, well, if the user estimate is uh, based on high counts uh, and differs a lot from the prior, then trust that more than whatever the estimate that is producing and so on. But you can think of the model as sort of a combiner that is combining the information from very simple signal predictors from each of the individual historical features. So why is that approach so popular in industry? So first of all, in domains like fraud or ads, uh, it 
is on primarily because it is really the way to get state-of-the-art results. Uh, in those domains, you accuracy truly is revenue. Uh, so therefore, the fact that it's so successful there is a nice empirical proof of the fact that the technique is fairly strong in general. It's also a good fit for our modern day uh, most common production uh, large data infrastructure, which is the MapReduce platforms like Hadoop. Um, and the counts are easily computable on those systems uh, because it's just a kind of a classic uh, single map reduce uh, exercise to construct a table based on a very large data set. The key benefit of the approach, though, is the fact that it results in a modular system versus if you were to use, say, a linear learner uh, with feature hashing, you would have a single monolithic system with many, many parameters uh, without physical meaning, really. I mean, they're, they're, they're coefficients, effectively, on the various weights. Uh, but because of correlations and so on, it's hard to ascribe specific meaning to individual coefficients. While here, the tables actually truly represent the historical counts that have been observed. And thus, it's pretty straightforward to tune uh, the weight. So for example, we can, if we see uh, certain, that for, for certain domain, uh, only recent data is needed, we can manually choose to discard old data more frequently. Uh, we can monitor uh, the tables for rapid changes uh, indicating, say, attacks. Uh, we can also replace uh, or add tables easily for experimentation, again, without having to do dramatic changes to the system. And what's really important for large production systems is that this makes the whole system fairly monitorable and debuggable. So in the sense that we would just watch for uh, differences on the tables themselves and on the distribution of predictions, uh, it's straightforward for us to track of what is changing as time goes by. So you know, if more traffic is coming from certain APs or more clicks or there's a bot farm, uh, that can be detected easily as opposed to with an online learner, a separate monitoring system needs to be set up. And because temporal changes uh, are occurring all the time, it is imperative that we do monitor them. Uh, but more than temporal changes, uh, there are also things like emergency recovery. So if there's a bot attack, how do we just take out its effect? Uh, with on classic online learning systems, it's really hard because you've already, you know, you've already done all the updates for all those examples. You can't quite unlearn. As opposed to here, you can just run a map reduce subtracting the counts for, say, a bad day or for a bad IP, and the damage uh, from the bad data is completely undone by a very simple procedure. The predictions are also decomposable. Uh, if we want to understand why a prediction uh, is such for any given example, uh, we can look at what the individual attributes were forecasting. Uh, and so when we see erroneous predictions, we can again see which features are to blame, so to speak, uh, or if it's the combiner that's not aggregating them properly. And here I will hand off to Girish, uh, who will describe how this technique uh, is available in Azure ML. Uh, but of course, uh, this is something where, because it's so simple, all of you can try to just implement it on your own using your favorite infrastructure. While with Azure ML, uh, we've provided it for you uh, out of the box. And Girish will take it away from here. Well, thanks, Misha. Thanks for the great introduction to Learning with Counts. Uh, so, folks, like I promised you, I will now uh, show you a quick demo in the Azure Machine Learning Studio. Uh, let me start off uh, by launching the screen share again and uh, showing you what these modules actually look like in Azure Machine Learning. So, here we go. Uh, we have two modules in Azure Machine Learning. Uh, the first one is called the Build Count Table module. And the second one is called the count featureizer module. Note that, uh, like Misha was saying, when you build the count table on the data that's to be used for counting, you then have the class conditional counts built. But now you still need to featureize them and include them as count features in your train and test data uh, to build models that use these features. So let's take a very quick look at what options we have for building count tables. Um, you, have, you are building class conditional counts. So you can specify the number of classes. You can specify the number of bits of your hash function. Uh, typically, the number of slots available then for dropping things in are essentially 2 to the b. We're going from 0 to 2 to the b minus 1. Uh, if you want reproducible experiments, it's highly recommended that you set a seed. One of the great things about this module, the build count table module, is that it can consume data in various types. It can consume a data set, which is a native data set within Azure Machine Learning Studio. It can consume a blob 
which is essentially an Azure, uh, blob in Azure blob storage. And for large data, you can also let MapReduce loose on it, like uh, Misha was saying. And uh, this basically allows us to uh, issue uh, a query on the count table to an HD inside cluster and get the counts back. Uh, so these, so I will I will actually skip over some of these because most of the stuff here is actually just credentials that you need to enter to get your data to work. But uh, if we forward all the way down, then we have a few things here that are very useful. Uh, we have the count table specification or the count column specification rather. Uh, these are the columns that you want to build the counts on. And then you have the label column specification, which is the column that contains the class labels. Finally, you have the blob format. Is it CSV, is it TSV, or something else? Similar to this, we have the count featureizer. The count featureizer basically generates the count features, and here you just select on the list of the counted columns and the set of columns to featureize. In addition to this, there are some advanced uh, options here. You have a garbage bin threshold, which says, hey, if I have less than X number of samples, ignore it entirely. You also have the option of smoothing using uh, prior pseudo examples. And uh, you can also decide whether your output feature should include both counts and log odds. So remember that the counts are the N plus N minuses. The log odds are the log of N plus divided by N minus. Uh, so you can decide if it should include both. Include counts only, log odds only, and whether it should ignore the back off column. The back off is basically the tail, and you can also decide if that should be ignored or that should be included. Now that I've given you a very sort of quick intro to these modules and what they look like, let's take a look at an experiment that I pre-ran in interest of time and uh, show you the benefits of using account tables to build count features on the high uh, cardinality categorical features for the NYC taxi data set. So again, let me just zoom in a little bit and then I'll zoom out. Uh, this might look a bit complex, but it's not at all. There are two sets of experiments here. On the experiment that I'm focusing on right now, essentially builds count tables on the data. So you can actually see we have a count table here. If you try to visualize this, it would give you the class conditional counts. There we go. So the column index tells you the columns we are counting on. Uh, we only show 100 here, so you don't see the column index changing. The hash value is the value allotted with the hash function, and the class conditional counts are from class 0 to class 4. Similarly, with the count table, we also have some metadata. So we have, it tells you the number of hash bits used, the hash seed, the number of classes. Now, let me pause here for a second and clarify why we are using five classes. We are modeling the problem in the following way. Given the features, driver features, number of passengers, pickup time, drop off time, the lat on, stuff like this. Can we bin the tip? Can we predict which bin a tip will fall into? And the bins are as follows. You have dollar zero being class zero, dollar zero to dollar five being class one, class five, dollar five to dollar ten being class two, dollar ten to dollar twenty being class three, and greater than dollar twenty being class four. So that gives us the five classes from class zero to class four. Uh, okay, so moving on with this, are we loading from a blob? In this case, it's false. The count table type, which I didn't discuss in more detail, but Misha touched upon, is that you can build dictionaries or count min sketches. In this case, I chose to build a dictionary. And finally, which are the column indexes we are counting on, which is in this case one, two, three, which are some driver details, and 11, 12, 13, which are uh, pick up and drop off locations. Uh, so, in this case, we are basically just using a very simple multi-class logistic regression learner, and we will look essentially at the confusion matrix between using count features to basically model these high cardinality categorical variables, and an experiment on the right which uses the exact same train test data but does not build count features. So let me go ahead and give this a whirl real quick. Let me just hit run here. This should actually run very quickly because it was. Uh, pre-built in interest of time, and I'll then be able to show you the confusion matrix comparison between uh, using uh, count features and not using count features. So it should, it should be done shortly now. There we go. If you look at the evaluate model and click visualize, 
So let's, let's take a minute or two to go over this uh, data that we have here. Uh, on the bottom, we have two confusion matrices. The left shows uh, the NYC taxi uh, tip pin confusion matrix, if you like, when count features are used. And the right uh, shows the result of not using count features. Now, from the data, we know that class 0 and class 1 are pretty numerous. In fact, if you look at the data, they con constitute about 95, 96% of the total data. In, for the more prevalent classes, we find that using count features versus not doesn't give us a big bang for the buck. Uh, this is because you have plenty of data to learn from that leads to lower variance uh, in representation. But as we go to the rarer classes, like class 2, 3, and 4, uh, the fact that uh, the categorical features are very high dimensional and there is less data to train from results in a very high variance model when you do not use count features. And therefore, we can see that for class 2, 3, and 4, the accuracies are actually better across the board for using the, uh, for using the count feature model. So you see 71.1% against 68.9, 75.9 against 73.8, and 13.1 against 11.1. The class four is expected to be pretty poor because uh, how many people tip more than $20, right? It's a very, very small fraction. So there's extremely little data to learn from there. But overall, we see that the basic uh, point is that uh, using count features to basically reduce the dimensionality of representation of high cardinality categorical features uh, can buy us something in two things. It can buy us model accuracy. More importantly, uh, the more compact representation allows us to create more complex models. And along with that are all the benefits that Misha mentioned. Uh, easy, easy disaster recovery. You can retrain models very fast. You can change your counts as you get new data. And it lends itself very nicely to a MapReduce type of approach. Uh, I'll just stop my screen share now, and then I will uh, get back to concluding this tutorial. So, I, uh, so putting it all together, as I guess what we showed it in what we showed in this tutorial was HD Insight for large data storage and MapReduce processing. We also showed you an IPython notebook if that's the way you want to go in terms of issuing high queries and getting results back. Uh, we showed you Azure Machine Learning Studio, which is cloud machine learning and analytics that are accessible anywhere you have a browser and resources on the cloud. Uh, Misha talked about a very cool technique called Learning with Counts, which is intuitive and uh, flexible and uh, scales extremely well for big data sets. And finally, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for taking the time to listen to us. We have some useful links here in terms of signing up for a free Azure machine learning trial and learning about how to use machine learning. Uh, sorry, Azure machine learning. If you would like help with teaching it in the classroom, uh, please don't hesitate to contact uh, Misha or I. Uh, and if you have any other questions, uh, please, again, contact Misha or I. And with that, thank you very much. Great job, Girish and Misha. Thanks for that. The live demos are always great to see as well. Um, so we are at the Q&A portion of today's event. And as you can see, there is the contact information in terms of email for both Misha and Girish. Uh, I would encourage anybody that's interested in contacting them following today's event to please jot it down so you can reach out to them. So with that, we're going to start with the questions. Uh, the first question, Misha, I think this one is for you. But if not, uh, Girish, you can jump in. Uh, what if the patterns of learning change? How long will machine learning algorithm, how long, I guess, will it take for machine learning algorithms to realize it and then serve an appropriate ad? So it's a hard question to answer in the general case because uh, it all depends on, you know, what is the specific change uh, we're talking about. So I think that in light of the approach I presented earlier, uh, if you think of a specific example, like say for a given a given user used to click on ads and now they stop clicking ads for whatever reason they say they installed an ad blocker or something. Um, so depending on how the tables are set up, so for example, if for ads in practice, you may want to set up a separate table that captures last month of data, last week of data, last day of data. Um, if this type of change is common enough uh, in user population, then the combiner will basically figure out that, you know, by looking at the different tables for different time intervals, uh, it should trust the most recent one more than the less recent ones. Uh, so I think as with most machine learning, this comes down to like, well, is the, is the effect uh, prominent in the training data and are the features revealing it? In this case, the way to reveal the effect would be the 
for, for change an existing item would be just to have the temporal window. Uh, for a new item that, you know, we, we had a, we have a new query that's, you know, coming out, the Surface 3, uh, it just never occurred before. We have no counts on it. Suddenly it came out. Uh, by, by design, it will, once there's enough volume on it, it will enter the tables and there we now have the counts. So there, there's no patient work that needs to be done or, you know, designed to be thought of. Uh, so for, for new values appearing, that's where the technique captures it direct immediately. Okay, very, very thoughtful answer to, uh, to a good question. Uh, next one is, what type of technical background do you need prior to using Azure ML? Uh, well, I think uh, the, the goal is uh, the less, you know, the, the less the friendlier. Uh, I, I think it, this is an area where there's really sort of no, you know, no harm in continued self-education through whatever courses you can take. Uh, to be clear, I think I think the current product assumes the, it certainly does not assume, say, graduate level ML courses uh, that have been completed. It does assume basic familiarity with the, you know, machine learning as a predictive tooling uh, system and sort of understanding that, okay, the, there is a training set, there is a test set. Um, I would say for starters, there's an, so Coursera, the original Coursera courses such as Andrew Ung's course is much more than is needed for sure. Um, I think now there's more sort of lighter on math and heavier on application courses uh, to, under the data science umbrella that would be sufficient. But in general, I would say if even like a, a low double digit number of hours uh, introductory course in machine learning data science uh, would be sufficient. Any intro course in data science would definitely be sufficient. Okay, very good. Uh, next question is, can Azure ML workflow allow the wiring of arbitrary R code into the analytical workflow? Sure, uh, so let me take this. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, Azure Machine Learning has a couple of modules that allow for wiring not just arbitrary R scripts, but also Python scripts. So for R, for instance, you have the execute R script module, uh, which allows you to basically include any portion of your R scripts in there. And if you want to go the extra mile and also, for instance, use, let's say, the random forest from R or GLM net from R to train your own models, you can do that using a create R model package uh, module. So both of these actually, I think, give developers and data scientists and BI engineers the flexibility to write uh, custom R scripts uh, in the analytical workflow. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Girish. Uh, the next question is, is there a recommended size of data to be operated on MS uh, Microsoft Azure ML platform? I, I, there's always questions about the size of data, the structure of data. Maybe you can go into some more depth in that regard. So we can give some sure. really quick uh, guidance. Um, with the current product, uh, within the core, the data sets that goes within the core studio, uh, we currently advise the staying within 10 gigs. But it's uh, the HD Insight and Hadoop option that allows you to go as wide as possible. So, for example, uh, right now we're using a terabyte size data set as our sort of go-to experimentation bench. Because at that point, it's the Hadoop, the HD Insight cluster that shards the data across multiple nodes. Um, and then, the, as uh, Girish has shown, you can use Hive to operate on it directly uh, and read using Hive queries from Studio, say, downsampling. Or if you're doing learning with counts, again, the learning with counts module will launch uh, the MapReduce job against the cluster directly. So at that point, you are working with, you know, terabyte size data sets from the studio. Uh, but for most other modules, again, this is where, just to be cognizant of the current guidance, is, is about 10 gigs. Okay, very good. So we've had several questions uh, asking about sort of the price model of the toolkit. Can you go into some detail right. about how things are sort of structured in that sense? Sure. Uh, so one of the nice things I think about HD Insight is that uh, uh, you you have several levels of uh, machines you can choose from. So you can go all the way from the smallest machines that I think barely cost anything, a fraction of a penny an hour, all the way to very big uh, D-series machines that can be a few dollars an hour. Uh, one thing is that. The second thing is that with HD Insight, it is fairly easy to commission a small cluster quickly and take it down quickly. So you can uh, you can really do uh, use it as you go and pay as you go option. Uh, because if you want to, let's say I saw one question about somebody asking, how do I get ramped up on HD Insight? 
and machine learning since it's quite expensive, but it doesn't need to be. You can certainly learn HD inside by commissioning a small cluster that costs you almost nothing, learn the basics, and once you're done, uh, before you go on to your next project, you can tear down the cluster because you only pay for what you use. So that's sort of that and the fact that there are these uh, tiered levels of machines that you can use, I think uh, allows people to learn uh, how to use HD insight in a cost-effective manner. Very good. Sounds great. Uh, so we had a few questions about the, the learning with counts as a technique. Is, is learning with, ca with counts a new technique, or has it been used before in applications? It's anything but new. <laughs> so actually, I've tried tracing the history for some time. Um, so it definitely has been used in the online advertising world for at least half a decade to a decade. Uh, in fraud, it's been used for at least a couple of decades at this point. Uh, risk tables has been one of the names under which it was used. Again, you can think of it as a natural evolution of uh, base type techniques where just instead of you know just multiplying or adding the odds, you're now having a cascade model with a stronger learners downstream. Uh, the earliest mentions I found of the overall count technique as a kind of a standalone technique were in uh, compiler branch prediction literature from early 90s. But again, it's, it's just so in, once you kind of once you discover it, it becomes very intuitive and sort of a go-to <laughs> tool. So that's where I wouldn't be surprised if it was like under under various names like historical statistics and so on. It probably was used for machine learning applications always in different variants. And just here, we're just providing kind of a more formal outline of what 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 it what it's composed of and how it's used. I think people have always just used it sort of informally as like, well, here's what our features are, just feature engineering. Okay, sounds great. Uh, so the next question is, can we count and train on the same data set? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so I didn't have time to go into it. Uh, that's actually one of the things that kind of a nice technical vignette that we hope to actually put out a tech report uh, within a month or so. Uh, yes, there is a way. It's uh, I'll, I guess I'll give away the answer. The answer is that there is an. Inter it, it's it's uh, if you just try doing it, you definitely run the risk of label leakage. Uh, so it's not kosher to just do it point blank. Uh, that said, for lots and lots of data, uh, sometimes you may get away with it if you're doing enough smoothing. Uh, there is a nice principle solution based on a pretty obscure technique from theory called differential privacy. Uh, which in this case actually becomes uh, very relevant. Uh, in, in practice, that simply means that you just apply noise uh, from a Laplace distribution. Uh, in the module, uh, there is a parameter which is actually called Laplacian noise factor or something. This is exactly what it's, what it's there for, is if you don't want to hold out separate data for counting and for training, uh, you can just use that, basically add some noise, uh, and that will prevent the leakage. But it, it's a great question. Yeah, that's... Okay, very, very, very good answer. Um, more questions on the data and sort of the counts. How how are the raw counts smoothed? Can you go into some detail there? So typically, you just use uh, what's known as a plot smoothing to where you add a certain number of uh, what I call pseudo observations, and then for the two classes, you just use the overall population prior. Um, so in, in effect, I think about it the following way: is that I, if, if we're doing the click prediction for ads. On average, say for search, there's like 5% of click probability. So if we observe uh, for a given user two clicks and seven non-clicks, and we are adding one pseudo click, we'll, we'll use that 0.5, you know, one and 20. So we'll be adding 20 uh, non-clicks uh, for it. Uh, so basically, the, the, if you just look for Laplace smoothing, uh, that's the standard technique. Okay, great. And then kind of connected to that is, is uh, and you, you did talk a little bit about data size, but I just want to make sure this question is answered or asked. Uh, what was the largest data set you've tried with this technique? I guess 1.3 terabytes, 1.4 terabytes. Uh, 1.4, so in turn... So in, in, internally, basically in an earlier implementation of the technique on the internal custom system, we've gone to, I think, I'm definitely hundreds of terabytes, uh, but on a much, much larger cluster. But I mean, the beauty of it is that it's scale. I mean, so in, in here in uh, HD Insight, yeah, the 1.4, and do you remember that, that was with a couple hundred cores, right, Yurish? I believe we're uh, yeah, 400 that cores? Yeah, that was basically with a, yeah, with a couple of hundred cores, yeah. yeah. Okay, so in other words, it can handle an awful lot. Yep. Uh, so the next question is, uh, we always get this kind of question, which I think is a good one to ask for everybody, is 
someone that's just kind of starting out. So this particular one is uh, I'm just beginning to look into predictive analytic solutions for my organization. Uh, what is your recommendation to someone who is completely new to predictive analytics uh, and methodologies and the process in terms of how, how they would go about, you know, looking at options for their organization? Uh, watch a few tutorials. <laughs> I think so. So that's one thing with Azure ML. I think even in the, in the front page, we have links to quite a number of tutorials. Uh, and I think and they assume different levels of familiarity with predictive analytics. Uh, I think it, it's always, you probably, it's worthwhile to invest into some like very, we, we're obviously biased to, towards Azure ML. Uh, but in general, I think you just want to sample few far away, as, points as far away as possible. Uh, from each other and just sort of to give you a better, you know, view of what is out there. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, and one thing is it's also, it's a contact sport. So that's where one option is just to maybe not go with your, you know, big industrial data set with all the complex features and, and so on, but then uh, pick out some very simple toy data set, uh, say like one of, like like the, I guess New York State City Taxi is not quite toy because of the size, but the idea is that you pick some public data set, say like Titanic is a popular Kaggle data set. We just look for Kaggle Titanic, uh, which is, I think, was predicting survival. Uh, and then just play with a few tools and sort of see how a simpler, smaller data set with a clear task and clear features plugs in and how do you use the tooling. Right. Okay, I would just good. add one more okay. thing that, uh, just to reiterate one of Misha's earlier points, if you would combine that with a course on Coursera or some other basic data science course, then you should be all set uh, to actually build predictive analytic solutions for your company and your particular problem. Very good. Another resource is uh, Data Science Central does offer the forum section. So anybody that wants to enter a question or participate in discussion, the, the, the community members are always very helpful and sharing what, what has worked for them. So you can use that in the forum section of DSC. Uh, the next question is, do you have any uh, Microsoft certification for Azure ML? Oh, good question. Uh, I am uh, not sure if there's one right now, but it's definitely something that's on our minds. So that's, I think, that, <laughs> but for now, I don't believe we have it out there yet. <laughs> right. Okay, something that's maybe coming in the future then. Um, how much do we need to know about Hadoop and MapReduce uh, to to use Azure ML effectively? Nothing at all. You don't at all. I think a vast, yeah, a vast majority of the experiments that we that are in the gallery and also that people work with don't use any Hadoop or MapReduce uh, paradigms in any way. Okay, e easy enough. Uh, so again, we're going to go real quickly back to uh, learning with counts. Um, how would someone that is kind of new to that uh, kind of step in and uh, ramp up on that side of the predictive modeling side of things? So we have, a, so there is a blog post uh, from a few weeks ago that sort of describes kind of the gist of it, I think. So if you want just kind of a, you know, couple page or doc that gives you a, like a more structured presentation of what's going on, it's there. Uh, there is also a sample experiment. So Azure ML Studio has this gallery of a variety of experiments. Uh, once you sign in, you just see a link to it. Uh, and in the gallery, there is a sample experiment, uh, which is fairly straightforward and sort of is documented in the comments uh, that describes of how it's done. I believe also there's a plan to post another blog post focusing more on the on kind of detailing out all the stuff that Girish has shown today in the next few days. Uh, but again, we'll give you sort of, sort of a sample. Okay, very good. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to let that be the last question since we have one last poll I'd like to have the audience participate in. But just before I move this slide, again, anybody that wants to reach out to Misha or Girish, please take down their contact information. There are lots of great resources out there for, for every level of data scientist, um, and I think these guys are certainly interested in uh, helping you out. So the last question is just want to get an idea of how helpful this event and this webinar has been specific to Azure Machine Learning. If you can just mark the appropriate box real quick, um, and then we'll move forward so we can end the event on time. So again, just give me a quick idea of how helpful this would be, was in terms of giving you uh, information about it. Uh, go ahead and mark your selection, then I'm going to proceed forward. Great. Thank you very much for that. Do appreciate it. Um, just a couple of quick announcements to make. 
uh, to please mark your calendars for April 14th in our next Data Science Central webinar, The Science of Segmentation, What Questions You Should Be Asking Your Data, sponsored by Pivotal. Also, as I mentioned, this event has been taped and is going to be made available later on this afternoon at Data Science Central. This brings our webinar to a close. I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance. Some great questions came in. Some great questions were answered and fielded by Misha and Garish, and I'd like to thank Microsoft for their sponsorship and Misha and Garish for their insight into today's topic. My name is Tim Madison, and I've been very pleased to have been your host today. I look forward to seeing you all on April 14th. Good day.